Ibadan, July 28, 1966. The situation was tense. Northern civil servants, chiefs, and traditional rulers who had traveled to the south for the conference of traditional rulers were ready to leave. Apprehensive of being targeted in the so-called Plan 15 Igbo plot. This video is a full account of the July 29, 1966 coup in Nigeria, detailing how General JTU Aguironsi was overthrown in a northern counter coup. Hello, 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 his blast. Welcome back to this episode. Remember to smash the like button on this video and subscribe for more videos. Subscription is free. Just click the red button down below. Thank you. There were erroneous reports that the conference hall was going to be bombarded. Nevertheless, the military governor, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Adekunle Fadri, hosted a grand reception in the evening, which bellied the simmering tensions beneath. The hand of fate was beckoning. Ironsi and Fadri both served in the United Nations Organization for Congo Peacekeeping Operations from 1960 to 1964. Fadjui was a well-known Nigerian officer who was the first to get an international military citation. Nonetheless, in response to a call from Lieutenant Pam Mwadikon in Abiokuta, Lieutenant Garba Dada Paiku roused other northern officers at the 4th Battalion, including Major T.Y. Danjuma, who was staff officer at Army Headquarters, and had accompanied Major General J.T.U. Agui Ronsi from Lagos and was temporarily staying at the late Malk Barracks. Dada told Dan Juma, Sir, we will have to do the same thing. The most important target is the Supreme Commander. For as long as he is there, everything we are doing here is nothing. We should go there. Following a brief discussion with Lieutenant Ibrahim Bako and Lieutenant Abdullah Hisheleng, a short phone call to Lieutenant Colonel Moritala Mohamed in Lagos was made, since Mohamed had previously asked the boys to stand down from their pre planned coup. Mohammed, on the other hand, originally advocated prudence, since he was unsure whether his earlier clash with Auna means that Igbo officers and troops in Lagos were already armed, and as Auna had threatened, he may have the upper hand. Danjuma, Dada, Bako, Sheleng, and the duty officer James Onoja opted to ignore Mohammed and proceed with operations in Ibadan, fearing that exposed northern mutineers in Abiokuta would be isolated and hence, likely, captured and accused if they delay action. Because Danjuma did not bring battle gear to Ibadan, he borrowed one from Lieutenant James Onoja, who had just returned from a course in the United States, and put it over his pajamas. Danjuma then armed himself with a hand grenade to commit suicide if the mission failed. Soldiers were then rapidly chosen from infantry companies led by Onoja and Schelling at Mokola. While Sheleng took one group to man checkpoints along the Lagos and Abiokuta routes to protect the city's southern approaches, Major Danjuma was accompanied to the government house in the early hours of July 29, 1966, by 24 soldiers under Lieutenant James Onoja, some say in two Land Rovers mustered by the motor transport officer, Lieutenant Jerry Useni. The main goal was to isolate the premises cut the Supreme Commander up from the chain of command and arrest him as a bargaining tool in the case of the boys who killed Okonweze and others in Abiokuta. The government's house was already guarded by the National Guards Company led by Lieutenant William Welby, who was in charge of the 106mm recoilless rifle group as well as some troops on duty from the 4th Battalion who reported to the battalion adjutant as well as the duty officer. After confirming that the Supreme Commander was present, Major Danjuma was faced with two command difficulties. Both stemmed from the fact that he was neither a member of the 4th Battalion or the National Guard, despite being the senior of all the boys on the ground. The first course of action was to secure the cooperation of the 4th Battalion forces stationed there. The second was to gain the National Guard Commander's cooperation on the ground. To deal with the first difficulty, he requested that the adjutant Paiko issue a legal order requiring all his men on duty to be disarmed by the duty officer, Onoja, who was on the scene to perform a legitimate inspection. They were legitimately vetted after being disarmed by the duty sergeant and those who could be trusted that these northerners were illegitimately rearmed. 
They were then bolstered by the pre-selected group that Danjuma had brought along with Onoja from the barracks. To deal with the second issue, he went straight to Lieutenant William Welby and got his support. This wasn't a really difficult task. Despite the fact that they were in separate cells, Welby had been to separate meetings in Lagos with Joe Garba and others and was well aware of the basics of a coup attempt, even though he did not expect one that night. Danjuma was under pressure from the boys on the ground to continue the operation once the building was surrounded and the 106mm gun was positioned in support. There were suspicions that General Ironsi was aided by Juju and that he may disappear at any time using his crocodile based on Congo folklore. Junior officers who had joined the party advocated for a quick assault, with some even recommending a rerun of the Nziogu assault on the Nasarawa Lodge in Kaduna in January. They wanted to utilize the 106mm weapon to take out the complex. But Danjuma stood firm against the pressure. Lieutenant Colonel Hilary Njoku, commander of the 2nd Brigade in Lagos, then walked from the main building and proceeded to walk right by the on-duty soldiers on his way to the gate. According to one report, he traveled up from Lagos with Ironsi, stayed at the guest house next to the main lodge, but was now at the main lodge with Ironsi, socializing with both Ironsi and Fajui. According to one account, he traveled up from Lagos that evening to brief the commander-in-chief when suspicion of a coup spread among senior Igbo officers in Lagos. He was fired at by soldiers who had been ordered not to let anyone go when he attempted to leave the premises ostensibly to mobilize lawyer units, and he reacted in kind. Some believe he was the first to fire. He escaped with serious injuries, according to some reports. Njoku made its way to University College Hospital at first, but had to flee when a mop-up squad arrived looking for him. Lieutenant Onoja asked for permission to leave at this point, claiming he needed to travel to the barracks to get more ammunition. But thinking that Njoku's escape would mean the coup would fail, he panicked and fled in one of the Land Rovers. Later, he was apprehended in Jeba. When it became clear that Njoku had escaped, Danjuma, escorted by two guards, went around the lodge checking all guard posts and was on his way to the guest house when the phone rang. He reached out and picked the phone. On the other end of the phone was Yakubu Gowon, who demanded to speak with the brigade commander, Colonel Njoku. But Njoku was absent. After a brief talk over the phone, Gowon cautioned Danjuma to avoid any further bloodshed. It is not clear from available information what Gowon did with the explosive information he had just gained from Danjuma or how he and Ogundipe planned to deal with it. Danjuma does not say any senior officer, Gowon included, explicitly asked him to stop what he was doing. Was there any rescue effort from any quarters having been informed that Ironsi was surrounded by troops of the 4th Battalion? Or can we conclude that Gowon was complicit in the coup? Please leave a comment below. It appears that a decision was reached by omission or commission to adopt a negotiation approach rather than confrontation. In any case, T.Y. Danjuma was isolated when Onoja ran away. With no duty officer on site and no other officers from the 4th Battalion, the noon commission officers began to doubt if they should follow bizarre orders from this major they had never met before, who was dressed in a mis-sized American satin combat uniform over pajamas and wasn't even from their unit. They began to suspect Danjuma was an able officer based on his physique and bearings, as well as his reluctance to destroy the building. Fortunately for Danjuma, Lieutenant Abdullahi Sheling arrived from his checkpoint on the Abiyokuta route to check on affairs and persuaded the non commission officers to obey him by assuring that he was from the north. As daybreak came, other officers, including Paiko, returned to the scene. Nevo's troops then went straight to Garba Dada Paiko and asked him to blow up the house, but he refused, unless Danjuma approved. But Danjuma preferred to keep the siege going patiently waiting for the occupants to come out 
of the building. The opportunity will present itself around 8 a.m. when the governor and the head of state were set to leave for town to attain official engagements. The one odd mistake was that no attempt was made to disconnect the phone lines at the lodge. Lieutenant Sani Bello, who was Iran's army ADC, emerged from the building at 6.30 a.m. to find out what was going on. He was arrested and told to remove his shoes and sit down on the ground after a brief confrontation with Dan Juma and a group of hostile Northern Noon Commission officers. Members of the head of state's motorcard and delegation were also halted and asked to sit down on the ground as they arrived from their guest chalets. Colonel Olu Thomas, an army medic, and Chief C.O. Lawson, secretary to the government, were among those seized at 7.30 a.m. Lieutenant Colonel Fadri personally emerged from the building at this point. According to all the sources, his ADC disappeared all through the night and switched sides. After a brief confrontation with T.Y. Danjuma, which indicates that the boys were there for his boss, he was led back into the building to meet Ironsi. At this point, Danjuma was brandishing a hand grenade to commit suicide should there be any attempt by Fajui or Ironsi to fight back. A moment later, they got to Ironsi, who shouted, quote, Young man. And Danjuma responded, Sir, you are under arrest. Ironsi then asked, What is the matter? In his response, Danjuma replied, The matter is you, sir. You told us in January, when we supported you to quell the mutiny, that all the dissident elements that took part in the mutiny will be caught martialed. It is July now. You have done nothing. You kept these boys in prison, and the rumors are now that they will be released because they are national heroes. Ironsi, who was visibly surprised, said, Look, what do you mean? It is not true. At this point, Ironsi and Danjuma began arguing with Fajiri getting in between them and reminding Danjuma again and again of his promise that no harm would come to Ironsi. Danjuma interjected, Fajiri, get out of my way. You, just calm down. Danjuma said to Ironsi, You organized the killing of our brother officers in January and you have done nothing to bring the so-called dissident element to justice because you were part and parcel of the whole thing. But Ironsi argued, Who told you that? You know it is not true. Danjuma then said, You are lying. You have been fooling us. I ran around, risking my neck, trying to calm the ranks, and in February you told us that they would be tried. This is July and nothing has been done. You will answer for your actions. At this point, Danjuma and Lieutenant Andrew Mwanko, Ironsi's Air Force ADC, had a fierce verbal exchange, with one holding a grenade with a pin pulled and the other holding a pistol. But with the fingers of five other soldiers on the triggers of automatic weapons, Mwankwo was outgone. When the group got downstairs, Danjuma instructed the adjutant of the 4th Battalion, Lieutenant Garba Dada Paiku, to take the pair to the guest house at Mokwa, pending death or full inquiry. But Dada was not committed to the commitment of safety for the two. After a fierce confrontation between them, Fajui turned to Danjuma and said, You gave us the assurance. Danjuma replied, Yes, sir. I am sure you will be all right. But he was wrong. He had lost control of the situation already. Both Ironsi and Fajui were squeezed into a front seat of one vehicle and taken away. They drove to Mile 8 on Iwo Road, where the group dismounted and went into the bush, crossing a small stream. Ironsi and Fajui were subjected to beatings and interrogation. It has been reported that Ironsi was shot by an angry northern officer because he refused to respond to questions and confess his role in the January coup. Sources say this officer was Sergeant Chijani. Fajui was not spared either. He was also shot. Although the Western Region publication, Fajui the Great, published by the Ministry of Information in 1967 after his official burial said he had offered to die rather than abandon his guest. Those involved in his arrest and assassination insist that he was an even more critical target than Iran C. This 
is an account of the July 29, 1966 Northern Counter Coup in Nigeria. For an account of the January 15, 1966 coup, which became the most bloodiest coup in Nigeria's history, believe in some quarters and an Igbo coup, click this video here. Please like this video so that others can see it as well. Don't forget to subscribe to his pool media. Subscription is free. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video. Peace.